Welcome to the Transformation Leaders Podcast. I'm Tony Lockwood and I'm delighted that you could join me on this latest episode. Each episode takes the form of a discussion with a leader who openly shares their experiences of leading organisations through the transformation journey. On this episode, I have a fascinating conversation with Edwina Pike, covering many areas, although talking in some depth about the change in transformation requirements resulting from M&A activities. Edwina also discusses what she means by irrational change and why, why this is so important to organisations undergoing transformation. Enjoy our discussion. Hi Edwina, thank you very much for joining us today on the uh, the latest Transformation Leaders podcast. It's great to have you here. Um, let, let's start, as we always do, by introducing yourself. Tell me a little bit about you, about your background, your career today, and, and how you first moved into change and transformation. Hi Tony, well thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here and this, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So um, I started out, um, and I have to be honest, I'm a failed engineer um, that was my early part. I did not get the A-levels I needed. I did not go to university. And I ended up for somehow in IT. I'm not sure how I did it, but I basically <laughs> learned as much as I could. And by the time I was 24, I was an IT director. Right. And I thought that was my path. I could see myself being CEO, CIO by 30. And then I realized there was an epiphany moment when I realized that actually I didn't enjoy the technical part. And what I really realized, as many in IT have already, it's all about the people. It doesn't matter the, the quality of your solution. It doesn't matter um, how slick it is. If people don't adopt it, you're going nowhere. Absolutely. Um, so I pivoted my career into uh, the time program management. And then a company that I really admired in my field had a team of what they called change managers, a dedicated team, like an internal consultancy of 20 people. And guess what? I wanted to be on that team. I've okay. never wanted a job so much in my life. And it was a long process, but I made it one of two out of 700. Wow. And I spent the next 20 years officially as a change manager, managing massive scale organizational transformational change, flying around the world, doing global stuff. The last 10 years in the world of M&A integration, specifically all over the world, but specifically for one organization. And we integrated, just to give you some, some idea of scale, because I know scale always counts on stuff like this. Uh, we probably did about 30 deals across 15 territories, including emerging markets like China, Africa, India, South America. Um, we spent probably in the, somewhere in the region of six billion um, pounds. Mm -hmm. um, some of those were like two point two billion dollars and added fifteen thousand staff. Some of them were founders with maybe like two million euros and three staff. So a real wide range. Um, so, and I would say M and A integration probably is the extreme end of change management. But I believe there was a different way and a better way of doing things. So while I was doing that, I also had a side gig where I used to teach change management in the organization. And we had a big community of practice and I probably taught over a thousand change agents. Right. And here's my second epiphany after I realized I didn't like technology, which is however much we trained the change agents in the great skills of change. It didn't make any difference at all. Yeah. It was all about the environment they were operating in. And we pivoted to teaching change leaders. Yeah. Well, that gave me a passion. So when I could, I have left my corporate career and created something we call irrational change, which is where I do, which is what I do now. Yeah. Where I have, I use my passion and my purpose to improve the way we do change, improve the way that we do change and the way that we look at change, because I think most of our current models aren't working particularly well. We'll come back to that in a second if, if, yeah. if we can. Um, we always start these podcasts in the same way so we can get the context of the conversation. And it's, it's with one question. Uh, how do you define transformation? Well, that's a biggie, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those words, like the word change, that is so often misunderstood. Absolutely. Um, and it gets used in so many different contexts and everyone has a different understanding of it. For me, it's actually a really simple thing is I'm taking something from one state to another. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's something that in my mind is a change of strategic direction. It's something that's bigger than the day to day operation. It's not business as usual. It's something that is a considerable step change that needs to happen. Yeah. Typically, it crosses functions, divisions, teams, geographies, something like that. That's something that's quite big. 
um, something that is very specific, that has really specific expectations, values and outcomes. You summed up there a lot of what other people have said um, uh, in, in terms of that definition. But we, we asked the question because it is a big question and there are so many different interpretations. So I want to come back to what you've just said in, to, in your introduction as well. And, and, and you, you, it's very rel- uh, evident within your LinkedIn profile. You talk about being the, uh, a leader, an architect and a mentor of irrational change. Explain a little bit more about what you mean by that term, irrational change. So it's, I, I suppose, this is where the failed engineer piece comes out, because as a failed engineer, I'm still trying to engineer and fix problems along the way. Yeah. And I, but with a 30-year change agency career, you're trying to solve things and say, why are things not working? Because change is hard. Irrational change came out of a big aha, probably around 2013, so probably about 10 years ago. And I suddenly realized the world of, well, I suddenly discovered the world of cognitive science and behavioral science. Mm -hmm. And as an engineer, I'm always trying to apply what I learn back to the world of change. And how can we work smarter, not harder? I like to joke I'm fundamentally lazy. I'm not really lazy. I just like to work very efficiently and do very efficiently. So the world of rational change comes out of this concept. And I think also for those of us that have been around for a while, the world has changed. You know, 20 years ago when I started out, email was not the main form of communication. Memos were. We had intrays. We went to meetings. There was agenda sent in advance. There were minutes sent afterwards. You had time to think. And in today's world, you just don't have time to think. Technology is coming at you faster than ever. Information is coming at you faster than ever. And we are pretty much cognitively overloaded all the time, especially if you're a leader. The expectations of leaders have gone up so much over the last 20 years. It so, is isn't it, though? Because yeah, I, 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 we're, we're um, similar sort of backgrounds in, in, in terms of you know, having that experience of working with paper and then technology starting to come in and mobile phones starting to come in. And I, and I remember the play when it came in is that it's going to make our lives easier. It's going to make our lives simpler. And, and in reality... All it's done is made it much more noisier. And actually, our brains our brains have not evolved to cope with our modern world. Yeah. Um, and they're trying to solve sort of four macro problems. Um, and one of them is the fact that when you are cognitively overloaded, you have to choose what's important and what's not important. So you start discarding information. You start looking for information that matches your beliefs. There's a whole load of stuff going on. It also creates, in the world of cognitive science or behavioral science, says actually humans have predictable patterns of behavior. So the outside, they look entirely irrational, but we all do it exactly the same way. That's why when you look at Amazon, they put the five star, four star, three star, two star, they they put those up there because they know that will drive your purchase behavior. So we're all solving these shortcuts in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start to bring that into behavioral change, you can predict where humans are likely to make the choices they're going to make. You can also work out how to de-stress the change process. And in irrational change, we say your humans are not rational. So why is your change plan? Mm. Most change models, methods, methodologies that get used assume a rational process that if you persuade a human why something is a good idea, they're likely to do it. But that assumes an idealized, like a vacuum environment where nothing else is competing with it. Well, guess what? Mm. Our world of organizations and corporations is an entirely competitive environment where things are competing for your attention 24-7. You don't have time to stop and think. You're triaging. Mm. So rational change is all about how do you factor that irrationality into your change process because ultimately, your humans are your most valuable source of competitive advantage. The humans you have in your organization, your people, are your most valuable, most agile, most um, flexible source of competitive advantage if you treat them well, if you get ahead of the game, if you create an environment for them to be successful. There you go. That's a rational change. That's great. And and I I want to uh, explore that a little bit further um, in due course. Um, You you touched on it in your introduction again that, you know, for the last nine years in your corporate career, 
uh, you were heavily involved in in M and A and and leading the integration programs uh, across those global and M and A activities, and 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 I think it'd be great just to um, extract in, uh, some some of your experiences um, of the do's and don'ts or stuff that works and hasn't worked in those integration pieces. Because I think over the next few years, because of everything that's happened, there's going to be lots more M&A activity happening. Uh, and, and, we've, and, and certainly I and lots of people have, been, have had experience of going through a merger or an acquisition at, when it works and the end result is, is, is significantly better than the, the, the individual parts. But equally, lots of us have had experience of where, where it hasn't worked. And uh, so it'd be good just to explore that and, and maybe then interweave the, um, the rational change aspects of that as well. Oh, thank you. Tony. And I have to be honest, what we a lot of the learnings, M&A is almost like the, the extreme end of, of what we do. And we're changing behaviours, we're changing cultures. And so much of what I've learned in that is now what is fed into become my daily practice or our daily practice. Mm-hmm. So some of the things we learned from this one is that um, the first one I would say is know your value. So whenever there is an acquisition, people don't do an acquisition just for the sheer fun of it. There is either some value that they're trying to achieve or some risk that they're trying to mitigate. So know where that value comes from, because there are expectations related to that value or expectations related to that deal. Whether it's a case that there's going to be synergies and now you're going to have like um, a greater route to market, you're going to have more manufacturing capacity or you're going to be able to move into new markets, whatever that might possibly be. There is something that that organization brings you. In the tech world, it's often about bringing some technology into the business. Mm -hmm. So there is some value that is expected out of the deal. Now, M&A deals are one of the few things that you don't just have a steer code. They typically get reported to the board. Mm -hmm. And the performance of the deal gets reported to the board as well. So they are externally visible. A president normally stands up and announces it. So it's not like your average transformation project. Everybody's eyes are on you now I was really lucky I got to sit in the deal room so I saw it right the way from the deal room through to the actual end adoption the end delivery of value all the way through the business case and I would say that 90% of what I did in my day job was change management it was managing behavioral change on the way through (laughs) a few other things I learned it's never a merger so whenever people talk about being a merger, it's never a merger. There is always a winner and a loser or a perception of being a winner or a loser. And it's normally signaled by a range of different things. The, whoever gets the top job is a massive, great signifier. And whoever gets the top job normally brings in people because they're human. And that's the second thing I would say here is that um, deals are not that they're humans. There are humans' emotions sitting beneath that. And actually, there's a lot of human biases that operate in the deal room and all the way through the deal. Mm. So this, there will be signals and signs to where the value is and who is really taking over what. Humans naturally surround themselves by the people that they trust. Mm. So whoever gets the top job is likely to bring in people that they trust because I'll be honest with you, it takes time to build trust. Yeah. And I probably don't have the time, the heat of a deal, especially a big scale deal, to build the trust in my team that comes in. It's also, there's a dynamic at the moment around private equity. So in the old days, private equity used to come in, restructure finances, add a load of debt to the business, get their value back out, and the job was done. Well, those easy deals are pretty much all floated through now. So now their job is to come in and transform your business. Yeah. And they're working to a set of financial ratios that they think will give value to the business. So they've got a very clear sense of what they want to achieve as their outcome. And they're coming in to transform and get to that clear sense. So know what value they're looking for and recognize that that's where they're going to drive towards. And you'll also notice that they change a lot of the leadership team. Mm. Yeah, I was told in my early days that for a culture to shift, you have to shift 80% of the leadership team. And that's what often yeah. private equity will do. And, and it, it, it's that old adage, isn't it? it it's um, you, you tend to do the things that you've always done. Yeah. Uh, unless you um, uh, intru- are introduced to a new way of looking at things. But if you don't change the dynamic of that team, the likelihood is you, you carry on doing the things you've always done. Because you don't know what you don't know. You so don't introducing know. those new people is, is the way to start to take people on that step change. 
Which also brings us to an interesting thing that I think applies in change as well. And we use it a lot now in our, in our practice, which is I would go into every project and, and the nature of an M&A project, you can't tell anybody you're doing a deal because it's price sensitive, it's share price sensitive. So on day one, when we announced the deal, I would literally have a bunch of people show up on often a Zoom call because it was a global deal. Yeah. And I would sit there and I would have to brief uh, what is what I just they've just realized they've become my integration team. <laughs> and the first thing I would say, our mantra, we used to have a couple of mantras that used to exist for us within the team. The first one was expect surprises. And it sounds a silly thing to say, but it was a bit of self-talk that we introduced into the project teams because I can guarantee there would be surprises. When you buy a house, you think you know what you're buying. You've been to visit it. You maybe had an engineering survey. When you actually move into it, you suddenly realize that maybe the heating doesn't work quite the way you thought it did. The radiator in the back bedroom doesn't work. The garden floods if it rains really heavily. All of these things are surprises. Yeah. Well, in acquisitions, that just happens on a bigger scale. However much due diligence has been done, due diligence is typically targeted at the value and the risk side of the deal. Yeah. To try and get the underneath due diligence is much, much harder and few invest in a real deep cultural due diligence. Mm -hmm. So expect surprises, expect there to be some ambiguity, but that also gives you flexibility. If you know where your value is, that's your what you're trying to achieve. That's your outcome you're trying to get to, which means you've got flexibility of how you're going to get there because that's the expectation to meet. So expect surprises. Great point. How did you then manage those surprises through? So, you know, shit happens, as we know, and, and um, it's, it's typically how you respond to, to that event uh, is, determines how successful things are going to be. So what type of, uh, what type of approach did you adopt when shit happened? There's really there's a couple of things we use. And actually, this is where the power of your self-talk is quite interesting when you talk about the word transformation, how the power of language really matters. So there's something about organizational self-talk and how you talk about things and how you think about things. So the first one is if you see something as being a problem, if you see something as being an issue, if you talk about problems and issues and risks, you'll find that you're thinking about them in the negative side and you naturally become quite defensive about it. So we used to carry some phrases and we used to use the phrases quite a lot because they become part of your internal thought process. So expect surprises was one of them. So when we got a surprise, we would all laugh and say, expect surprises. I, by the way, always bring humor into my projects because I just think it helps and a positive thing. We didn't talk about problems we talked about opportunities so it wasn't a problem it was an opportunity to think differently we have another great phrase which is um, every day is a school day when we learn something new so we used to have language that encouraged yeah. learning encouraged the fact that it wasn't a problem it was something that was an opportunity we didn't make mistakes we grew yeah. we grew and learned something different we learned how to do things differently we explored and and grew from it so shifting the self talk within a project shifting the self talk to a can do attitude rather than a can't do attitude also recognizing what is your you might call it your minimum viable product what are the things you absolutely are the true real real non negotiables versus what are the nice to haves yeah. what is the what because if you know what the what is as long as you meet and you stay within the boundaries of what is the right ethics and the right standards that are absolutely required, your how is very flexible. We had one other thing we used to throw in there as well, which was a big one of mine. And I, and I still teach this now, which is we also used to do this thing called ask for permission and not for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why we did that is that often the people at the front end of the business have the best judgment because they really understand the situation. And the minute you delegate a decision upwards, it becomes an opinion that may be made in a decision made by somebody who isn't quite so well informed. Now, it requires you to understand judgment. It requires you to understand and take on board on your shoulders. What are the risks to my business? Um, so, yes, ask for permission. Sorry, ask for forgiveness Forgive and me. not permission. But in the same way, you don't run crazy decisions, yeah? It's, yeah. It, you take the ownership. Having the, Having the framework in place. It, it's interesting that coming back to the point about surprises, though, by framing it in the way that you did, it, you almost changed the whole uh, approach to say, we, we expect surprises. So 
actually, let's go and look for them. You, 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 yeah, you, we did. You, you attract them to you. Because you were they, rewarded. You take the, the opportunity that, that they create to, to, to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. And what was interesting, actually, we I changed my attitude because I always used to teach that humans hate change. And actually, I shifted my attitude completely um, during my time doing M&A, which is humans don't necessarily hate change. In fact, we change day in, day out all the time. Yeah. But what we really hate is surprises because surprises make us feel out of control. We lose our ability to predict the future. And if you hate surprises, if you know that you hate surprises, the other thing I would say is the more senior in the organization you go, the higher up the leadership ladder you go, the more visible you are and the less you like surprises because you're just that more visible. You're just that much more at risk. So one thing we used to do a lot of is we used to very cleverly set expectations and manage expectations so we would ask questions to understand what everyone's expectations are and then proactively reset them where we needed to the other thing we would do is we would do it in a nice way again without asking them to make decisions but we would when we had to make those micro decisions that you make throughout a project life cycle rather than surprise your steer co or your board because you've made lots and lots of micro decisions and it doesn't quite look like what they expect you to get we used to inform them. Now, remember Rasky, inform rather than consult or ask for a decision. We used to inform them. So we never, if, if any stakeholder was ever surprised, we took that as being a point of our failure that we had surprised someone. Interesting. So, and that works in the world of change really well. Totally, totally agree. Because you use the word surprise. I use the word people don't like uncertainty. And, 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 and it's the same same principle, isn't it? it? Yeah. It, it's your ability. You might not be able to tell them exactly what's going to happen in the future, but you probably will be able to tell them what's going to happen in the next week, yeah. the next month. So given the certainty of the, the path that you're taking them down now and at, the, at what stage in the future you're going to be able to give them more guidance for, 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 for the longer term. And people can buy into that because, okay. as you say, that, that's life anyway, isn't it? And if you can give people predictability, and it's like the weather, you know, weather forecast. If you think back to twenty years ago, you, you know, you were lucky. You used to watch the, the the weather at the end of the day, you know, and Michael Foot would stand up and do a weather forecast and tell you what the next day's weather might be. Now you get minute by minute. You're, it's going to rain in thirteen seconds in your outside your house front door. Um, it is very much about that. And humans like predictability. Um, we hate vacuums. We hate to have a vacuum. We actually include something in all of our comms. We include something which is called what is not changing. Right. Because all too often as a project team, we want to create attention in this massive world where data is coming at us from all the different angles. You want to create attention. And by creating attention, we tend to come up with a crisis or a this is going to be a big transformational change. Well, actually, when you break it right the way down, for the individuals involved, if you tell them it's going to be a big transformational change, in reality, it probably isn't. Mm -hmm. When you peel that onion back, often it's a project team saying, I've been working really hard at this. I've been working hard for ages. And I just want a bit of recognition that I've been doing really hard work. And this is transformational to the business. Yeah. So it's disassociating the project team's needs for some recognition and some reward yeah. and say, well done, good job to what the real impact is on individuals. Because when you look at it, actually a lot of the world doesn't change. A lot of the world will stay the same. They might be working with the same customers, the same products. A lot of the things that create stability are there. Going back to the point around um, the perception of mergers. Mm. And, 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 and I totally agree with you. Um, there is never a merger because fundamentally the person who gets the top job tends to put their team in place and they, they tend to come from the, 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 the area of business that they know best because of that. People like to work with people they know, like and trust. Totally, totally get that. Um, so there is a two organisations coming together a leader from one organization is probably positioned as the leader of the combined entity. He or she starts to put their team together, typically from um, their uh, historic um, position. How, what do you do and what have you done to mitigate the, um, the risk or the uncertainty or the concern of the team from the other side of that equation where they look up and suddenly their management team, their leadership team have disappeared. 
a couple, yeah, that's a good one. Um, there's a couple of things, actually. So if it's a really massive size of organization, then it's going to take a while for things to filter down anyway. So what you'll find is they'll carve up divisions. Yeah. When you are in an organization and the and you see very quickly that there's going to be some sort of acquisition and you see what the leadership structure is coming in, um, there will often be talk about creating a new culture. Mm-hmm. There'll often be talk about merging a new culture. But what you'll find very quickly is the symbolism will come in very, very, very quickly as to which way it's really going to go. Humans are hugely adaptable. When you get a new boss, you adapt very quickly to what their priorities are and what their needs are and how they like things to be done. And mergers actually work in a very, very similar way, which is you adapt quite quickly. The trick is not to overpromise and not to have the communications saying things that are either untrue or things that are unlikely to be realized because then you lose the credibility. In my experience, we did a couple of things. We would tend to be on the acquisitionary path rather than on the merger path. In fact, there's only two big mergers I've seen go through. One of them, they worked very quickly. They just carved up the business. So, you know, one side of the business got the pension team, one side of the business got the manufacturing team, another side of the business, you know, one of the other part, you know, one of the two merger partners got the sales and marketing. They they took what they did best. And I would say it probably took 10 to 12 years to get a holistic culture back together again and for that culture to naturally form where where it actually was. When it's a clear takeover, the trick here is to look at the the, the organization that is taking over and recognize very quickly that your world has changed. It it will change. The quicker you line up behind the the, the leading organization, the one that is leading and the signals of that, yeah. And the new leaders that are coming up in, the easier it is going to be for you. Yeah. In my world, I used to spend a lot of time with our acquired businesses, helping them understand the, what we used to call sometimes the mothership, because it was often in just in scale much, much bigger. Yeah. And the needs of the mothership, because the mothership operates with processes and structures and standards and things that you need when you're a global player. And as a smaller organization or as an organization that's maybe operated in a very different environment, you don't have those things. Now, however much the word is that you, you know, your culture is what the or mothership wants, and there is an attractiveness, especially if you're a smaller player, and you'll find that the executives of the mothership look into the smaller player and will actually look at it and say, hey, we want more of your culture, we want your entrepreneurship, we want your innovation. Yeah. But the mothership really wants to make you like them. Because that's how it's easy for them to work. So fascinating that you should say that, Edwina. There's uh, an example I got involved many years ago with uh, the launch of probably one of the first internet banks. And um, they grew very, very quickly. And then one of the, um, ultimately, one of the very large global banks bought them. (laughs) And the uh, message that came back is we wants we're buying your culture we're buying your approach we're buying your ability to take an idea and deliver it and transfer and, and and within a really really short period of time that's what we want we want you to bring that culture and, and instill it into the mothership in your words um and literally within six months or most of the senior people and the mid managers within that the, the acquired business went away and moved away because they, although they were saying, the words and figures differ, that's the term in banking, isn't it? And and the words and figures differ. They wanted something, but then they were just compounding um, and, and in, instilling all of the um, processes. And, you know, they had to get 25 ticks in the box before they could make any decision. And, and, and it stifled them. And, and all of that innovation, all of that real, dynamic team jump ship yeah um, is and uh, that's not uncommon it happens in tech as well um we actually it's quite funny we um we used to have like a an assessment like i, I said i'm a failed engineer so i like to have assessments and not i'm not held to them but i like to have a rigor to my thinking because yeah. it stops me it stops my own inherent biases in not seeing things because i want to see a positive outcome um, and we actually used to have a rigor to our thinking. And we used to take into account a whole bunch of things when we, when we were looking at an acquisition and, and, and acquiring it. And actually, whether we were going to integrate or not. 
Um, and part of our integration checklist, which is, do we integrate this new business? Now, it sounds obvious that when you acquire a business, you're going to fully integrate it and it can take the benefit of the mothership and all the rest of it. Actually, no. Mm-hmm. Some of the things that we used to put into our integration, do we integrate or not, included things like maturity level. So the mothership would run a you know, big ERP package like you know, SAP. It would have you know, artificial intelligence running, you know, all of this sort of stuff. But if now, this is a true story, if our acquisition business is running on an Excel spreadsheet, it's not quite ready for SAP yet. <laughs> so we used to have a thing called maturity level, and we used to break it down by function as well and say, where is the maturity level for each function? Because you can bring different parts of businesses across. So for example, we could take on the manufacturing because that that, that is something that is easy, the right maturity level. It's like for like, we'll take on manufacturing, but we leave marketing and sales behind or we leave finance behind because we need to raise the maturity level. The other thing we used to take into account is leadership is really, really, really important. And in in an organization, especially a founder-led organization, you see this a lot, whether it's a small one or a big one like the Elon Musks of the world or when Travis Kalanick was at Uber, very, very much founder-led. In a founder-led organization, the motivation of the founder makes a big difference. And each founder has a different motivation. Business is not business. Business is personal. There are humans in there and human behaviors, human beliefs, human expectations, human emotions, human biases. And, you know, I've met founders who actually love uh, love having a baby for the first like couple of years but when it starts to go a bit mass they don't really care for it anymore they want to start a new baby i have other founders who just love to grow it i have other founders who want to stick with the brand forever uh, you know so each founder has their own motivation and knowing what their motivation is because often remember right back to the very beginning i said know your value sometimes your value is in that founder and how they run some of their team. And in the past, we've actually protected and not merged or not integrated. We've acquired, but not integrated. But we have a set of criteria that says when you reach this level, when you reach this level of maturity, when your founder founder's motivation shifts, when you reach this level, we will integrate you across. But that stops the mismatch. Yeah, it, it, well, it's, it, it's key, isn't it, when you, 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 it's understanding, as you say, understanding the value yeah, and accepting that there's not one, a one-size-fits-all approach will allow you to deliver that value. So you, the question is, we've, we've acquired you because we want, to, uh, we want to access that value. What's the best way that we can maximise the value that you're going to be able to deliver to mothership? Not destroy it. Um, and you spend if you have to know where your value is so that you you know what you what what you've got to protect and not destroy Um, I spent probably as much time with the mothership um, helping them understand and actually acting as an interface between an acquired business and the mothership because they do things differently Um, they've both got great intent but they just do things differently and the mothership wants to make every division every every function you know the interface consistent because that's where efficiency and effectiveness comes from and that's where the scale benefit comes from so when you've got this little acquisition that doesn't work quite the same way <laughs> there's a natural tension so we used to build a lot of empathy and we used to build empathy because, as I said, organizations are human. And actually, the most powerful thing you can do is build a relationship um, and get to know humans and get humans to understand each other's challenges and what they need and why they need it. Um, empathy and relationship building makes a big difference. How did you go about doing that? You know what? It's all about putting each other in each other's shoes. So it's about getting to know each other. And actually, we now do an ex- we don't, now do some exercises, which I learned in from my from my m a world so much of m a is applicable to change um, we used to do some exercises where we used to accelerate not only the relationship building build connections build relationships but also accelerate trust so how can i accelerate trust building as well and how can i do that in such a way that i can then get to great relationships where there is a mutual trust where they'll help each other out they'll recognize that they've each got different needs and each got different um, challenges to overcome opportunities to do things differently Uh, but by doing that you'd it actually it it, you'd be surprised once you actually put that human connection in humans are amazing beings they can solve problems better than any process or standard or anything else can because they can see the the subtleties that are in there they can adjust so so, you must have put the context in place ahead of pulling them together the reason i the reason i sort of 
raise this is again another example uh, a few years ago organization of similar sizes mm -hmm. one acquired the other yeah um, the, there was a there was a, 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 a there was a real value in bringing the two organizations yeah. together because there was some overlap but not significant overlap nice the culture was completely different um which created many challenges as you can imagine yeah um but when we got to working um, at, at a detailed level, trying to strip out some of the efficiencies, the procurement directors of the respective organisations, they, they hadn't agreed which one was going to take the lead. So you were pulling them together to say, let's share some information, let's, let's work out what we can do and, and how we can do it and, and share information. And neither of them wanted to talk to each other because... Well, I'm not going to share my secrets to you because you might get the and, and that, that uncertainty was creating yeah. massive issues. You either get paralysis or you get competitiveness. Yeah. Um, and actually, if if you're in that situation, then there's always. So I I would also share this actually as a career tip. Um, if you are ever in the situation where you know you're waiting for your boss to be appointed or you're in the situation with not quite sure who's going to get the job i I've, I've recommend this many 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 times over and it's worked for me at least three times in my career is take the space mm. because humans co-regulate against each other and if you take the space if you act up act up take more space act up in a, in the missing level of your boss if you take that space and act up when the new boss comes in they will adjust to the space that you have taken yeah, yeah. if you want to get promoted there is no good a sense of entitlement i should be promoted is never going to go down well mm -hmm. but if you start acting up and i always always recommend this when i coach and mentor people is act to the next level up so if you're a level five now act at level four the more senior and think about how a level four behaves yeah. act at the level four and you're more likely to get your promotion because people see that you are ready for it yeah. and you're already acting at it so take the space act up now in any organization, we actually normally, there's three things we normally say that are winners. And the first one is role clarity. If you do not have clarity of your role, if you do not have clarity of what is expected of you, or even on a project, what the, a good outcome looks like, you're going to go nowhere. Yeah. You will paralyze with uncertainty. So role clarity is probably your number one thing that can make the biggest difference to anyone. Defo. Brilliant. Um, it, it, it just, I was starting to think back to, to um, one of the meetings within this client uh, and the two procurement directors were opposite each other um, in, this, in this meeting and I was observing what was going on. It was such, it was so funny. It was, it was almost like a little play acting out oh, yeah. um, and, and it's just oh, yeah. it really funny to observe but that, that, that we go down a tangent. Bring it back. Uh, we, we come towards the end. We always end with the question of what's your one non-negotiable in terms of driving change and delivering transformation. What's the one thing that you feel is absolutely essential? What I'm going to say is not going to surprise anyone, but the context I'm going to give it will surprise you and may be a little uncomfortable. So you can only achieve as much change as you have leadership for. Yeah, humans like to be part of tribes and tribes have leaders. And we the biggest thing that motivates our behavior in any organization is pleasing our boss and staying safe in our tribe. The biggest barrier to leaders leading change is us as change agents. We have trained our leaders really, really badly. They don't go to leadership school. Yeah, it's our job to coach and guide and help our leaders stand up and lead. And all too often, we facilitate them. We facilitate them not leading. We write their comms for them. We do the things. We, we take on a delegated role and we go and talk to their change targets for them. So leadership, you can achieve as much change as you have leadership conviction for. Leaders get the outcomes they deserve. And we as change agents, it's our role to create leaders who can lead change. Otherwise, we will get the outcomes we deserve. Great way to uh, to end the podcast. Thank you very much, uh, Edwina. It's um, it's it's been very insightful. I think we've covered off a lot of things that we've not covered off in previous episodes. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tony. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to hearing more of your guests as well. Thanks, Edwina. 
I really enjoyed our discussion and your approach to irrational change in particular opened up so many thoughts in my head about how I can apply this thinking in subsequent client engagements. Ultimately, this is the core purpose of this podcast, to share proven approaches that can help you successfully deliver transformation within your organisation. The Transformation Leaders Hub is a community focused exclusively on those operating within Change and Transformation. If you've not checked it out as yet, do so today by clicking on the link in the show notes. I look forward to sharing another episode with you in a couple of weeks' time. Bye for now.